If you go and look up a photo of a boxer from the 19th century, it's almost certain that the individual will be standing like the gentleman pictured here. While it may look a little silly to modern fans of the sport, this was actually a very effective fighting stance for those wishing to win a 19th century boxing match. For anyone unfamiliar, the reason this old-timey, once ubiquitous fisticuff stance is so mocked or derided by fans of the sport today is for the glaring weaknesses inherent to it, namely that the boxer stands with their hands low and their chin up, a great way to get your head pummeled. While it's certainly true that a person utilizing the fisticuff stance would be in trouble in a modern-day boxing match, a modern boxer would likely be in just as much trouble sparring off against a pugilistic champ from the golden age of boxing, if they box by the rules of that period. As for why, most pertinent here is the fact that neither boxer would be wearing gloves in such a classic match. As paradoxical as it's going to sound, boxing without gloves is actually widely considered to be safer than boxing with them. Among other reasons, because bare-knuckled boxers rarely punch one another in the head with full force, so the risk of brain injury and knockout was dramatically lower. You see, lacking protective hand gear, punching someone in the head with every ounce of your physical might, especially when you're as powerful as professional boxers are, is a great way to very seriously injure your hands, particularly when done repeatedly. Combine this with the fact that many 19th century boxers sometimes competed multiple times per week and that there were no time limits for many old-timey bouts, one match in 1893 even went 111 rounds before ending in a tie when after seven straight hours, both boxers just decided enough was enough and refused to get out of their corners. From all this, you begin to see why protecting the head wasn't as much of a concern as it is today. While blows to the head did happen, particularly if a clean shot to the cheek could be had, the head tended not to be the focus of the fight. So that explains why the stance doesn't have the hands more directly protecting the head like today, but why the specific hand position of left arm out and right arm tucked. Among other benefits, this is partially linked to another, often overlooked, rule of the early boxing bouts. Prior to the Queensberry Rules, officially introduced in the 1860s and proliferating from there, the rules of the specific prize fights between pugilists varied, but invariably allowed grappling. As an example of how things were before more civilized competitions, in 1713, Sir Thomas Parkins described a typical boxing match as including eye gouging, choking, punching, headbutting, and other such street fighting tactics. This all changed when Jack Broughton developed the first set of formalized rules for boxing in 1743. The impetus for these rules came in part from Broughton's defeat of George Stevenson, who suffered severe injuries and died a few days later after the pair's fight. Saddened by the death of his competitor, Broughton wrote the Broughton rules to minimize the harsher aspects of the sport, like forbidding striking below the belt, not allowing hitting a competitor when he was down, and giving him 30 seconds to recover and continue the fight, lest he be declared the loser. However, one thing Broughton rules did allow was the aforementioned grappling. As a result, the boxing stance of the era emphasized keeping distance between yourself and your opponent, initially usually with both arms outstretched. This not only made for a potential minor offensive weapon your opponent had to worry about if they tried to come in close, but also was great for teasing out and defending against jabs and glancing blows from a distance. Later, the tucked right, dominant for most, hand being held close was adopted to also help defend against counterhooks and body blows when your opponent managed to get past your left arm. And of course, the arm was cocked and ready to deliver more power powerful blows, while the other outstretched still helped keep opponents at bay. Keeping both arms tucked as is more common today would simply allow your opponent too easy grappling access to your main trunk, and as anyone experienced in things like boxing versus jujitsu can attest, if grappling is loud, even the best of boxers have little chance against a skilled grappler. Thus in this older style fighting, both had to be defended against and this stance was relatively optimal for that. With the introduction of gloves in actual matches, thanks largely to the Queensberry rules, before this gloves were mostly just used in training, boxing forms evolved, with the emphasis of the modern stance being protecting the head from the glove fist and no longer needing to worry about grappling moves. Old traditions die hard, however, and for a period in the early 20th century, despite that the bare-knuckle bouts had been phased out, boxers continued to pose like old-timey prize fighters for publicity stills, even though they now fought using a different style. Speaking of curiosities, ever wonder why in some countries you'll find eggs at the store are refrigerated, while in others they are kept at room temperature? Well, go check out our video here to learn the surprisingly interesting reason as to why.